again, I need to see like what those studies are because there is such a huge bias with the UN and li global liberalism that is imposing this kind of You heard it here for folks, it's a conspiracy. Oh yeah, because liberal powers have never conspired to impose their values on the rest of the world. Gentlemen, it's a true treat to have you. We'll let you get the ball rolling, Mike, with your opening statement. Thank you, James. Thank you to Modern Day Debate for hosting. So this is a debate I never thought I'd have to have because I assumed that as a species we realized the practice of child marriage was an abomination at this point. But apparently Muslims, like Daniel, think this is a practice he can defend as a moral good. The reason this debate came about was because Daniel publicly challenged me on the topic, which is, which is fine. I've publicly challenged people, but when I've done so, I've reached out to them privately to set it up. Uh, this did not happen, which left me confused as if this debate was going to happen. But I contacted James to make sure we certainly got to this point. So here are my goals. I will argue the practice of child marriage is not morally permissible because of the harm it causes. It leads to physical abuse, bodily harm, psychiatric problems, and a high risk of death. So if you agree with Daniel, Chris Hansen would like for you to take a seat. Take a seat right over there as we dive in. Now, the United Nations defines a child as anyone below the age of 18. I suspect Daniel will disagree with this because it's not the age of adulthood historically. So for the sake of clarity, I will define a female child as anyone who has not completed puberty. The CDC says puberty is complete in girls between 15 and 17. So it makes sense the following stage, age 18, is when we grant the status of adulthood. And so I will argue no one should really marry under 18 and no girl should be subjected to motherhood until she has decided that a child and has matured enough. Obviously, there is some variation when that occurs. Therefore, I will argue consummating marriage with a girl who has not completed puberty and forcing her to bear children is immoral. Now, Daniel disagrees with the science that supports this assessment. and said in his debate with Destiny, in Islam, you can consummate the marriage at puberty. Then in his post-debate review, he said, what is so fundamentally wrong about consummating marriage at puberty? This is a question that none of these liberals can answer. All liberals can cite is like these abstract claims about what is psychologically beneficial or harmful. But this has not been established. This has not been established scientifically. It's all just what's culturally acceptable in the post-industrial superpowers. Well, that's what I'm going to answer tonight. And I'll explain why it is immoral. Because once again, child marriages lead to physical abuse, bodily harm to girls, psychiatric problems. And despite what Daniel has said, this has been demonstrated scientifically. So the first thing to note is puberty is not a boundary point that girls cross over. It's a process. It takes time for a girl's hips to widen and for her to develop into a woman. This is nowhere near complete when a girl has her first period. To treat womanhood as a boundary point for girls and not as a process is an unscientific way to understand puberty. There is no reason to assume a girl becomes a woman the, mo the moment she shows any sign of puberty, let alone she be ready for marriage and childbearing. Yet this is the Islamic teaching on the issue which Daniel has stated. Well, this study, that is marriage under 18, found that child marriage was a significantly associated with delayed antenatal care, miscarriages, preterm delivery, low birth weight, health problems in newborn babies, faulty feeding practices, lack of knowledge regarding family welfare methods, and health implications. They know child marriages lead to serious health consequences. It also bereaves young girls of their childhood by overburdening them with domestic responsibility, motherhood, and sexual relations rather than allowing them to play with friends or go to school. The study continues and says that child mothers are, not, are physiologically and psychologically not prepared for childbirth. Maternal morbidity and mortality is also noted to be high in such young mothers. The girls lack the maturity and the education to properly nurture their own children and then they make mistakes that hinder their own children's mental and social development because the girls have had their own mental and social development hindered by being forced to marry so young. So they then hinder the development of their own children. So arguing for girls to be forced into these situations is blatantly immoral. In 2007, the United Nations Children Fund reported that a girl under 15 is five times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth than a woman in her 20s. Another paper pointed out that girls under 18 are more likely to die from childbirth and debilitating illnesses like obstetric fistulas. In Mali, the, mater the maternal mortality rate for girls 15 to 19 is 178 per 100,000 of live births. And that is not just because of poor health care, because in the same country, the maternal mortality rate for girls, for, for women, that is, is only 32 per 100,000. In Togo, for the same groups, the rates are 286 and 39. And the reason for these high numbers is because they're more likely to suffer from eclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, and obstructed labor. Obstructed labor often leads to obstetric fistulas. 
That is where holes develop in the birth canal and can lead to leakage of urine, feces, blood, can cause nerve damage, the significant decrease in the likelihood of conceiving a second healthy child, as well as the death of the girl. The paper says girls 10 to 15 are especially vulnerable because their pelvic bones are not ready for childbearing and delivery. Their risk of a fistula is as high as 88%. Additionally, mortality rates are 73% higher for infants born to mothers than are children. Even the mortality rate for children under five born to child mothers can be 28% higher than those born to mothers over 20. Because as noted, many of these poor girls were not allowed to mentally mature and they lacked the ability and education to properly care for their children. A 2022 study found that girls who marry under 18 were more likely to be physically, emotionally, and sexually abused by their husbands in 14 of the 16 countries they looked at, with strong correlations in six. Additionally, they note pregnancy-related complications are the leading cause of death among adolescent girls in these regions. A review of the literature found that multiple studies have found the same result. They say the reason is because there is an extreme uneven power dynamic between the male and the female, mainly because of the age gap. The females, who lack decision-making abilities, constantly deal with harassment from their husbands and in-laws and are socially isolated. The review agrees with other research I cited that child mothers are likely to suffer from pregnancy-related complications, depression, and inadequate parenting skills. Another review shows, that, shows evidence of stunted social development, depression, and anxiety in multiple studies. Here is another study which shows child marriages cause young girls to have more suicidal thoughts and attempts. They say the study's findings are compatible with findings in the United States that adult women married as children were 1.41 times more likely to have had a lifetime history of psychiatric disorders compared with women married in adulthood. We see evidence that younger marriages increase the likelihood of divorce. According to data from the CDC and Institute for Family Studies, 48% of those who marry before the age of 18 are likely to divorce in 10 years compared to 25% of those who marry after 25. Daniel has repeatedly argued he wants strong marriages that do not end in divorce. If he thinks that, he should not be arguing in favor of child marriages. Now, I could go on and on, but I can find no psychologist or medical expert that agrees that child marriages should be allowed or practiced. They're described in these studies as a human rights violation because of the problems they cause. So there really is no escape from the conclusion. Child marriages likely lead to physical and mental harm. Anyone claiming a society would be better if we force young girls into these situations is either misinformed or delusional. So let's ask why Daniel thinks child marriages are morally permissible. In the same debate review, he said, it's something that has been practiced historically in all cultures. Why? Because you have a limited fertility window that women have to have children and you value family. You need family, especially in most of the countries in the world, because children are going to work in the home, they're going to work for the family, bring money into your family. You need children and your society needs more and more children to defend itself because wars are on the basis of manpower. So there's all these important economic, military, societal, familial objectives with having more and more children. And that requires maximizing the fertility window. Now, let's just set aside the fact that Daniel, either intentionally or unintentionally, just was, said he was okay with child labor and children being used in wars. May not have meant it. But let's focus how on in this. He provided no argument child marriages are morally permissible. All Daniel has ever argued for is the pragmatic usefulness of child marriages, not their moral status. Allegedly, they maximize reproductivity and increase the population size, but this is not moral justification. For example, if you want to increase your society's birth rate, you can make rape and adultery legal. But they are morally impermissible despite having pragmatic value in increasing fertility. Daniel has to give a moral reason for child marriages given the harm they cause. Do they increase virtue, decrease vice? help young girls to live flourishing lives? No. It's pretty clear from the data I cited that none of this is true. In fact, they're incredibly harmful. They increase mental health issues, stunt social development, lead to immoral acts like spousal abuse and suicide, and can even lead to physical harm and death. So it should be clear to every reasonable per person there's no moral justification for child marriages. Furthermore, they may not actually help increase the society's reproductivity if they increase the likelihood of death for the mother or the ch and the children. An educated society should outlaw child marriages if they care about their people and their well-being. And most people alive actually understand this. Research shows that child marriages decrease the more people become educated on this topic. But also, if we look at the average age women have their first children around the world, the, low, the country with the lowest age is Niger with a mean age of 18.5. So most countries where data is available actually understand it's better for a woman to wait for a girl to become a woman before she's expected to have children. 
If Daniel was correct, it's beneficial for a society to force girls to have children. Why is it not practiced more? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. It's because most people understand it comes with all sorts of problems that actually harm your overall society. Daniel has also appealed to the past and has argued child marriages were perfectly normal before these Western Christians came along and ruined all the fun they were having with children. Well, first off, on behalf of Western Christians everywhere, you're welcome. But second, although child marriages have occurred in the past in many cultures, and still, it still does not make them morally permissible. And third, studies on the Roman Empire indicate the average age women were married was still in their late teens to early 20s. Like today, many in the past understood forcing a girl to bear children led to serious complications. For the Jews of the same time period, it would vary from region to region, with the Jews in Babylon marrying younger. But the scholar Michael Satlow has pointed out the average age Jewish women would marry was still in their mid-teens to early 20s and after they had matured. Some texts even speak of a woman being ripe for marriage at 20. So if Daniel wants to argue that Mary, the mother of God, was a child bride, I will contest that. Even medical experts before the modern era spoke out against marrying too young. In the 2nd century, Serranus of Ephesus warned problems result if girls are married too young, in childbirth, that is. Kim Phillips, in her book, points out that Albertus Magnus advised waiting until after puberty before attempting to conceive children. Giles of Rome even said it's best for girls to wait until 18 before consummating marriage, long before the rise of liberalism. Phillips also notes there's no single marker that indicated the transition into adulthood. It was understood as a process. She says, canon legal theory on women's marriageable age offers a very limited perspective and that social beliefs and practices provide a more reliable view of girls' transition to adulthood. Now again, these books and papers do accept that girls were married at younger ages at times. But if we follow what the current science shows us, it makes sense that many past cultures had such high infant mortality rates if girls in those societies were having children at younger ages. Of course, Daniel doesn't need to defend marriage at 15 or 14, but consummating marriage with a nine-year-old. Because that is what Daniel accepts his prophet did when he consummated his marriage to his child bride, Aisha. And there's no reason to think this act set a good example for the rest of us. Now, before closing, I suspect we might see some whataboutism from Daniel, where he might try to argue there are child brides in the Bible. The problem is this would be confusing descriptions with permissions. The Bible describes things that happened in the past without claiming they were good actions. God often tolerated the sin of the prophets and the patriarchs and proclaimed their actions were morally good. I suspect he'll go to Numbers 31, where Moses tells Israel to kill all the Midianites but keep the young girls for themselves. And I suspect Daniel will argue God was permitting Israelites to take virgin child brides. But scholars like Robert Alter and Paul Copen note this was not a command from God. The text says this is Moses acting on his own out of anger. In the chapter, God only commands Israel to make war on Midian. And after that, Moses becomes angry and tells Israel to go one step further without God's involvement. Moreover, in doing this, Moses violates the principles of Deuteronomy 20, which says to not kill the livestock, women, and children in war. So Moses' anger caused him to order something that God directly argued against in Deuteronomy. And as we find out later, Moses' anger eventually got the best of him. Furthermore, Christians are under the ethics of the New Covenant, not the Old. There's nothing in the virtue ethics of the New Testament that would remotely suggest child marriages are morally permissible. Paul and Jesus taught the way we fulfill the law of God is by loving one another. And obviously, instituting child marriages are one of the most unloving things we could do. Christianity lays down a normative system of virtue ethics. And virtue ethics requires we study circumstances and natural facts to know how to properly love others. So given the science, Christianity is vehemently opposed to the practice of child marriage. And I can assure you that we Christians of the West will do everything in our power to end this obvious human rights problem promoted by people like Daniel. So I will press Daniel on this. He has to answer me on the studies I cited. Daniel, how can you claim child marriages should be practiced given the extensive harm they cause? If you argue in favor of child marriages, then I will doubt that you care about the well-being of girls. Also, you're required to give moral justification for child marriage not just ways that might be pragmatic for maximizing fertility. If Daniel does not, his position is indefensible and we will trust the medical experts around the world that child marriages should be abolished worldwide. Daniel is arguing against the consensus of medical experts everywhere, so the burden of proof is on him. The lives and the health of young girls everywhere are at stake. Let's see what he has to say. All right, thank you very much for that opening. Mike, we will kick it over to Daniel for his opening statement as well. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. 
Just a quick disclaimer that we are debating religious doctrine, history, and ethics. Nowhere am I advocating people break the law. I strongly advise everyone to follow your local laws. Many are appalled that we're even having this debate, and those people probably have a hard time imagining how anyone could ever think that marriage to a minor is acceptable. But the reality is all people historically considered minor marriage perfectly normal. If you give me a chance, I'll explain why. The first step is to acknowledge some basic biological facts. Puberty doesn't happen overnight or at one specific age. Rather, puberty is an extended process lasting from two to five years. The start of puberty also varies. It usually begins between 8 to 13 in girls or 9 to 15 in boys. Many factors affect puberty, including race and environment. For example, black girls reach puberty a year earlier than white girls. Puberty also accelerates in stressful environments like food shortages or absent fathers. But even in normal environments, 1% of girls have their periods by age 8 and 4% have them by age 9. This means that they have completed puberty by ages 8 or 9. Overall, children complete puberty in the 8 to 15 age range and start experiencing sexual desires. Now here's the million dollar question. How do children deal with those desires? I want all the opponents of child marriage to give us a practical solution for all the sexually frustrated minors out there. Because those hormones hit like a tsunami, creating desires that need an outlet. The outlet promoted in society today is an absolute disaster. Kids are taught sex ed as early as nine, and some experts want sex ed in kindergarten. You, you're barely done with primary school, and your teachers are passing out condoms and telling you to get birth control. Between 40 to 55% of high schoolers have had full sexual intercourse. If you include oral sex, the percentages are a lot higher. Many children as young as nine or 10 engage in these sexual behaviors. Experts say we have an epidemic of sexting, for example, among minors with 25% of teens texting each other naked pictures of themselves. Educators have responded by teaching children to practice safe sexting. Send naked pictures of yourself to other kids safely. Also included in sex ed is pornography education because the average age a child sees hardcore porn is 10. It's just become an accepted fact that children watch porn, so let's just teach them how to do it safely. The shocking news recently is that they've started to teach kindergartners how to masturbate. Meanwhile, there's an epidemic of porn addiction that's destroying the mental health and well-being of generations of youth. These are today's socially acceptable outlets for childhood sexuality. Hopefully, all Muslims and Christians here agree that fornication, masturbation, and pornography are not acceptable solutions. Rather, these practices destroy the moral fabric of society and corrupt the soul. But the problem actually goes much deeper. Sadly, much of the sexual activity for minors involves sexual abuse. According to the data, 28% of American children ages 14 to 17 have suffered sexual abuse. Some of this happens in churches, but the majority happens in public schools. According to reports, the sexual abuse of students in schools is more than 100 times the abuse in churches. Researchers conclude that by 11th grade, 10% of children have been sexually abused in school. That means that in America alone, 4.5 million children are victims. And none of this includes other forms of sexualizing children like drag queen story hour, the rise of pornographic educational material in school libraries, the sexualization of children's clothes, beauty pageants, and on and on. The point is childhood sexual desire from, from puberty is an unstoppable biological force. How does one channel those desires is the question, and Western society channels it through fornication, masturbation, and porn. In the best case, and in the worst case, the sexualization and fetishization of children as young as four. But for the vast majority of history, people of all religions and cultures had another solution, and that solution is marriage. Marriage is the healthy, wholesome outlet for the natural sexual desire that humans start experiencing at puberty. And pre-industrial religious and cultural traditions hold that marriage should be available at puberty. They don't stipulate an exact age for sex or marriage because, again, puberty is highly variable in terms of when it begins. So all religions and cultures have had this solution of marriage, but what changed? Why is minor marriage now seen as this unspeakable crime? To answer this question, let's look at the history of child marriage in the West. According to ancient Jewish norms, a man can marry and have sex with a girl as young as three. 
This ruling is found in the Talmud and is based on the precedent set by the Jewish prophet Isaac, who married Rebekah when she was three and he was 40, as inferred from biblical passages like Genesis chapter 30, 23 and Genesis chapter 25, verse 20. In Numbers 31, uh, Moses commands his armies to slaughter the enemy, including all adults and male children. However, female virgin children were spared for sex, although some have argued they, they had to be forcefully married. Whether Old or New Testament, there are many discussions of marriage and slavery in the Bible, but there's never any mention of a minimum age for sex, because apparently this wasn't a concern for the Bible's authors. Take, take Exodus chapter 27, verse 7 through 11, which permits a father to sell his daughter as a slave, but doesn't stipulate a minimum age. So he can sell his daughters as slaves or as sex slaves from infanthood. Interestingly, this is where the Bible and the Quran actually differ, as the Quran doesn't sanction selling children as slaves. The notion that it's acceptable to have sex with children, whether in marriage or slavery, was standard during the time of Jesus. For example, the Bible doesn't mention the specific age of Mary, but pre-modern Christians held she was quite young when she was married to Joseph and impregnated by Father God. According to the official Catholic encyclopedia, Joseph was 80 when he married Mary. She was 12 at the same time being Joseph's wife and impregnated by Father God. Now, some Christians might question the reliability of the Catholic encyclopedia, but many other sources, including archeological evidence, prove that the common age for marriage in Judea at the time of Jesus was 13. This is significant because Jesus' views on marriage would reflect those of his era, meaning that he would have endorsed marriage and sex with minors. We cannot find a single recorded statement from Jesus, raising even the slightest objection to the child marriage that was happening all around him. Jesus has no shortage of criticism for the Pharisees and larger society, but for some reason, he doesn't condemn anyone for child marriage. In later periods, some Christians adopted flexible guidelines for marriage that they borrowed from Roman law. Roman law was somewhat unique in setting a minimum marriage age for girls at 12. This was more of a guideline rather than a strict law because there were no legal penalties for marrying earlier. Medieval Christians in the West eventually borrowed the same rule, enshrining it in canon law. Christian women could marry at 12, but in some cases, especially among aristocrats, they married as early as 8 or 9. Those are examples from Jewish and Christian history. So why did things change? Two factors, industrialization and feminism. Let's talk about industrialization first. In pre-industrial societies, virtually everyone had to be involved with food production for sheer survival. You couldn't have freeloaders consuming calories but not helping produce calories. This meant that by necessity, all children worked in food production. This is why you don't see any kind of extended schooling for children historically. If kids are in school, they can't work to produce food. But starting in the 18th century, industrialization brought new technologies like tractors and mechanized irrigation. This meant a small part of the population could work as farmers and produce enough food for everyone. This led to the majority of the population moving from food production to manufacturing and service jobs. This caused a major social shift because working on the farm requires no education, but jobs associated with industrialization require more education. To deal with these socioeconomic changes, Western governments gradually introduced mandatory schooling. This went hand in hand with mandatory increases in the age of consent and marriage. This was especially necessary for girls because marriage produces children, and when people have children, they have no time for school. To prevent this, Western governments established minimum ages of consent. In 1791, the French Napoleonic Code established an age of consent of 11. By 2007, the French age of consent was 15. Same thing in Australia, Canada, and Western Europe. In the US, as late as 1880, many states had ages of consent from 10 to 12. In Delaware, it was seven. By 1920, it ranged from 14 to 18. But many may be surprised to hear that today, 25 states don't even have a minimum age of marriage. Between 2000 and 2018, there were 300,000 documented minor marriages in the US with some brides as young as 10. So industrialization changed attitudes towards child marriage. Feminism did as well. Feminism aims to empower women so that they have careers and status equal to men. This means banning early marriage for girls and encouraging them to stay in school for as long as possible. The fear is that girls may lose out on a career because they got married early and had children. 
Feminists consider such women victims who have failed in life because they haven't achieved independence and career status equal to men. The feminist thinking was impossible in the pre-industrial era because the overwhelming majority of the populace, both males and females, had nothing resembling a career. Almost everyone did low-skill farm labor with no education. For most of history, there was nothing like, a, like career advancement, so it would have been made no sense to insist that girls delay marriage to pursue career advancement. We can track the increasing Western hostility towards child marriage over time. One of the first examples is the famous 1748 work, The Spirit of Laws, by French liberal thinker Montesquieu. Montesquieu refused, refers to child marriage as a type of domestic slavery. Montesquieu associates such marriage with hot countries in the South. This includes Muslim countries, which had child marriage. So here in the mid-18th century, Montesquieu offers one of the first Western criticisms of child marriage in Muslim countries. Because of this growing liberal hostility, Western countries banned child marriage in the colonies they occupied, like India and North Africa. By the early 19th century, Western Christians magically discovered that their religion actually prohibits child marriage, despite 18 centuries of Christians engaging in it. With this new discovery, Christian missionaries traveled to these colonies and attacked the indigenous religions for allowing child marriage. An important case is British India, with a population that was 75% Hindu and 25% Muslim. Due partly to Christian missionaries in 1860, the British government set a minimum age of marriage for, of 10. This was raised to 12 in 1891. This is how liberal stigmas about child marriage were adopted by Christianity in the late 18th century and then globalized by the mid to late 19th century. This brings us to pedophilia. Pedophilia is not an ancient concept. The first documented use of the term is 1906. Pedophilia initially means a psychiatric disorder in which an adult fantasizes about or engages in sexual acts with a prepubescent child. Gradually, pedophilia came to mean any adult who has sexual interest in a person Person below 18, the age of consent. And of course, the age of consent is artificially set to match mandatory schooling ages. So in essence, the pedophile is someone who has graduated, who is sexually attracted to someone who hasn't graduated from whatever amount of schooling the state has mandated. Now, many will claim that child marriage causes psychological harm. It's interesting that pre-modern people understood trauma and the emotional damage that can come from certain sexual behaviors like sodomy and prostitution, but there's no evidence that anyone in pre-modernity viewed adult minor relations as traumatic. Even modern research casts doubt on the existence of psychological trauma from adult minor sexual relations. Psychologists Bruce Rind, Philip Tromovich, and Robert Bosserman have published meta-studies crit crit critically analyzing this. What they discovered is that while there can be problems in some cases, there's no inherent harm with adult minor relationships. The only harm comes from it being socially taboo in current society rather than anything objective or inherent. These psychologists received backlash, as you can imagine, and we can dive deeper into the studies later, but the point is the claim that minor marriage is bad because it objectively causes psychological harm is unproven. So it's bizarre that anyone should depict new modern norms on pedophilia as obvious or eternal invalidity. Such norms were literally inconceivable in the pre-modern period for the many reasons I've mentioned. All this is why attitudes for child marriage have shifted historically. The burden is on my opponent to give a better explanation for why there was such a radical change in attitudes starting about 300 years ago. If child marriage is this objective and universal evil, please explain why 99% of humanity throughout history was blissfully ignorant of this. This is even more of a burden for my opponent to explain because he's a Christian who believes in revelation. Why doesn't the Bible condemn child marriage? The Bible condemns homosexuality, which hasn't been as commonplace historically as child marriage, was the author of the Bible simply ignorant? Or is it more likely that the author of the Bible is fine with child marriage? That's certainly what countless Christians throughout history believed and practiced. Now I want to take things one step further. Not only do I believe that minor marriage was acceptable in the past, I also believe that it's an institution that society abandons at its own peril. The fact of the matter is children hit puberty in the 8 to 15 age range. When puberty hits, they biologically experience strong sexual desires and they'll express this one way or another. Either they'll express it within the safe, stable bonds of marriage, or they'll express it through masturbation, hooking up, sexting, porn use, or worse. The, those are the only two options. Any country that denigrates marriage for adults will inevitably encourage sexual liberation and promiscuity for adults. Likewise, any country that denigrates marriage for minors will inevitably encourage sexual liberation and promiscuity for minors or children. The unprecedented degeneracy we see in society today is a direct consequence of preventing minors marriage for minors. 
Christians of all people need to wake up and see what's right in front of them. And ultimately, this is why we all need to appreciate Islam and the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In his marriage to Aisha, the mother of the believers, he has provided a timeless example of this institution, which is so desperately necessary for all societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be going into the rebuttal section next. Mike, I have the timer set for you for eight minutes. The floor is all yours. All right, well, I think I did a pretty good predicting what Daniel was saying in his opening statement based on what I just heard there. Uh, let's talk about some of the things he said. So he said, it was perfectly normal before, you know, again, Western Christians came along and us. No, Michael Flynn notes in uh, Europe, European demographic system that the average age uh, people would marry between 1500 and 1820 in Europe was 25 to 26. Brent Shaw notes in his paper, The Age of Roman Girls at Marriage, that in Tuscany, uh, girls would marry between 16 and 21 on average, and Florence, 15 to 19. Rudolf Bell notes that in Italian communities in the 19th century, they were marrying within their mid-20s. Peter Laslett says that in England, uh, the average age that women were marrying was 22. Okay, and that was in the 17th century. Uh, Pitor uh, Gaswalski says in The Origins of the European Marriage uh, that the average age women were marrying in Poland in the earlier periods was around 20. And again, you can also read Kim Phillips' book, Medieval Maidens, Average Age Women Were Being Married, again, late teens to early 20s. But you brought up Bruce Ryan. I've been waiting months for you to bring up Bruce Ryan. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so let's talk about Bruce Ryan here for a little while. Bruce Ryan, for example, uh, it's probably the same paper you referenced in your um, the debate review is um, Harris Sultan, uh, hebophilia as a mental disorder. Uh, he says, for example, on page seven, child sexual abuse researchers have repeatedly maintained that hebophilic interactions are innately and intensely harmful for the younger person. And then he cites his own research to demonstrate that. So he is directly arguing that this is harmful to children. What he's basically saying in his paper is that the active partner, the human, is not suffering from a mental disorder like schizophrenia. It's something that naturally arises in humans, just like humans naturally steal, murder, and rape. That doesn't mean it's useful or good. He describes it as a harmfully mismatched, neurologically evolved, evolved traits on page six. But what Daniel's not told you about this paper, even though he's been citing it as far back as 2019, is the paper mainly focuses on homosexual hebophilia. He is trying to say that is not a mental disorder. He says it's been pervades in numerous cultures around the world. He's got a table in his paper that's four pages long of how homosexual hebophilia has been practiced around the world in various cultures, including Islamic societies. To quote from page 15, male to uh, immature uh, homosexuality was pervades in Islamic societies from the 8th to the 19th centuries. Boy attraction was seen just as normal as heterosexual ones. Main interest was in boys early to mid-teens, peaking at about 14. The appeal vanished with a beard. Adult men were scorned if they were passive partners because manly behavior was to be the active. <sighs> Staggering amounts of love poetry show an obsession with boyish beauty seen as comparable to women's as well. Poets attracted to boys constitute a who's who. Desire for boys, but not behavior or lust, was permissible under Islam. But behavior was common nonetheless. Oh, sorry, impermissible. The tradition eroded in the late 19th century in reaction to Western abhorrence and efforts to modernize. So, because Daniel's been quoting from Bruce Ryan's paper for years, he's put himself in a trilemma. Either he has not read it, uh, he's lying about what it is, or he secretly agrees with a lot of the things Bruce Ryan says and wants to return Islam to the days before Western influence when big strapping Muslim men could write gay erotic poetry about boys. So I just want to say, and it, but again, Bruce Ryan says this was eroded when Christians came in and basically ended it. So I'm sorry that we in the West came in and we took away your child brides and your gay erotic poetry with our Western values. My bad. Uh, so let's also talk about, he says, do girls complete puberty by eight or nine? No. According to midwifery uh, and women's health nurse practitioner certifi certification review, the CDC as well, uh, we don't see completion of puberty until 15 or 17, as I noted. I agree younger sexual activity for people under 18 is bad. I don't think you should have sex outside of marriage, okay? But his solution is child marriage. That's like saying, oh my God, I got a kitchen fire. Let's put it out by breaking the dam and flooding the neighborhood. We don't solve a problem with a bigger problem. I cited numerous studies showing how every expert around the world ag agrees this is harmful to children. This is harmful to their offspring. This should be abolished worldwide. He says we have to talk about channeling desires. Well, you need to remember as you're 
developing as a human. Your brain is developing, and researchers describe it as being plastic, plasticity. As you're developing, your prefrontal cortex is developing, and that's the part of your brain that controls inhibitions. If we have a child who deals with rage, we don't say, well, you've got to deal with that right away by just going around beating people up. We tell him to control his inhibitions. When children start developing sexual desires, they need to learn to control them. We should not give them the idea that they should act on them as soon as they got them because they're never going to learn to control those inhibitions when they become adults later and they see someone who might be tempting them or trying to get them to commit adultery. We, we got to learn to control these desires. This is why we slowly develop with a plastic brain, plasticity, and we learn to control our inhibitions. They need to be trained as the prefrontal cortex is developing. He cited the Talmud, but the Talmud, for example, Kiddush, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Kiddushin uh, 41a says that it's forbidden for a man to marry off his daughter when she is a minor until she is well grown. Okay, I also cited uh, scholars like Michael Satlow. You can also check out scholars like Am Amran Troper. They note the average age that Jewish girls were marrying was again, late teens, early 20s, earliest as mid-teens. He can find no evidence, Michael Satlow, that girls were marrying that young. Uh, he talks about the Catholic Encyclopedia saying Mary was impregnated. Uh, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, and that's how Jesus was, came into uh, human flesh, according to the Catholic tradition. But also, she was a perpetual virgin, according to the same sources. So if we're going to go off what that says about her age, she also never had sex. It's not a comparison. Okay, there's a lot here. He said that before Montesquieu, Western Christians were not condemning minor marriage. No, Serranus of Ephesus talked about the, da the dangers of it. Giles of Rome. Albertus Magnus, again, Kilden Phillips talks about this in her book. This was abhorred by a lot of medical experts. Now, did the common person not realize that? For the most part, a lot of them didn't realize how bad it was, but today a lot of people today ignore medical experts, so what's the problem? We should go on what the medical experts of the past and the present are saying, and they all seem to point to the idea, this is not necessarily the best thing to go for. Moreover, we should most of all be relying on medical experts of today, all of which condemn child marriage. Again, for all the problems I cited, I see no reason to accept this at all, given all the extensive harm it causes. So if the burden is on me, I've given the burden. I have showed how harmful it is, and it should be abolished. People in the past used to use leeches to treat all kinds of diseases. We now, they, they do not treat. Okay, that does not mean we should go back to what ancient people were doing. Okay, we now know this is not work. People used to sacrifice humans to the rain gods across the globe and hoping that it would bring the rains. We now know that does not work, okay? So we do not do those things just because people in the past did it, okay? Uh, with regards to the, the Bible uh, not giving an age, again, I'll go to Ezekiel 16 really quickly here. Uh, for example, it talks about uh, God, God compares Jerusalem to his wife and says, you know, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed. Okay, again, according to the um, uh, midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner, that does not happen until 17 when the breasts have been fully formed in the girl. And scholars like Robert Alter, Mark Rooker, Mark Rooker, Rolf Alexander all note this is talking about after puberty. So God is sort of setting the standard that sex or lovemaking comes a period even after puberty because it says that God even passed by her again after the breasts had fully formed. So there's another period of waiting. And again, this is what I can see from scholars like Peter Gentry, Andrew Mine, T.M. Lemma, Stephen Wellam, David Gundell, Ralph Alexander, Robert Alter, all of them are pointing to this. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Daniel for eight minutes as well. So um, Mike here is misunderstanding the argument. He's citing some average ages from different societies, like in some in Rome at a certain period it was 16, at another, in another place it was 20. The claim is not that the, my claim is not that at the average age of marriage is nine or 12 or 13. My claim is that uh, child marriage was practiced and was acceptable in all of these societies. Yeah, in some societies the average age was higher, but, that did, but it's the average, meaning that there is a proportion that are marrying even younger than those averages. Find me any society, pre-industrial society, that has a categorical prohibition of child marriage. You have failed to do that. Uh, you have claimed that Moses' commandments in the Old Testament, uh, where he commands genocide, that was done out of anger. It wasn't from God. And in fact, Moses violated uh, the, God's commands. But did Jews in, pre -modern, in the pre-modern period say this? Did Christians in the pre-modern period say this? Is this a reference to anything, or are you just making it up? Also. Um, why not simply say other morally problematic commands by Moses, like blasphemy punishments, were not sanctioned by God? 
right? There are many things that uh, Moses commanded that you would presumably find to be problematic. So why don't you just condemn Moses? Why don't you just say that Moses was a genocidal lunatic or a dictator? Uh, because apparently he, out of, in disobedience to God, commanded the slaughter of uh, ch uh, male children and taking female children as sex slaves. You made a big argument about maternal morbidity for girls between ages 15, uh, uh, eight, girls under 18. But the reality is that the maternal morbidity, according to the National Health Institute, from 15 to age 15 to 19 is about 1%. And that is right in line with the mortality for women in their 20s and their early 30s, which is also 1%. The maternal morbidity rate actually doubles after age 35 and spikes after age 45 and reaches as high as 70% for women over 50. So if you're really concerned about reducing the amount of mothers dying in childbirth or forming these fistulas, all of those are things that can happen after 35 and 40 at around the same rates as uh, girls as young as 12 or 13. So are you in favor of banning women over 40 from having children? Um, other people are also more likely to deal with disorders affecting fertility like uh, endometriosis or uterine fibroids and studies show that uh, risk of miscarriage is about 10% in your 20s and your risk goes up 53% in your 40s as I mentioned. So this is all things that you should be in favor of banning because these are uh, parallel to any kind of complications that happen um, at the puberty age. Um, so let me see, what else did you say? You also did not respond at all to the point that I made about fornication being rampant. What you seem to mention is that you advocate abstinence. People should just control it. Teens should just control it until they're over 18 because you, if they marry below 18, that's child marriage, which you're against. So does abstinence work? Does anyone here think that abstinence works? Clearly not. It's something that is widely recognized as a major failure. So really you're advocating for fornication, masturbation, porn use, are you against all of these things um, happening before the age of 18 or when someone is actually mature? Um, it would seem that your position actually is in favor of those kinds of practices begin because again, puberty causes this huge tidal wave of hormones that create strong sexual desire and children act on this sexual desire. What is your solution for that? That is what we need to hear from in this debate. The only other than fornication, pornography, masturbation, the only alternative, abstinence doesn't work, the only alternative is child marriage, and that's why it's so universal. That's why it is so universally practiced. Uh, Christians of all people should understand this and, and should be in support of it because again, and then Jesus is not, uh, Jesus is not condemning child marriage, why? Like if this is such a major evil, uh, that you claim. Why did he, does he not have a clear statement? This kind of reinterpretation from Ezekiel, Ezekiel when the breasts are fully formed, this is an argument that uh, Christian apologists have only made in the modern period. We, all of the authors that you cited as making this kind of argument regarding Ezekiel are in the modern period. There's no pre-modern scholar, Christian scholar, or Jewish scholar who has made this kind of claim about a minimum age implied from Ezekiel, Ezekiel in the Bible. Uh, in fact, and, and even that explanation, even if that were a valid interpretation of Ezekiel, breasts do form uh, by age, as, even as early as age seven. Seven percent of young girls have de developed breasts at age seven. Are they fully developed? No, but they're developing their breasts. This is puberty. So I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what puberty is. There are the, in, in medicine, they call them the Tanner stages. There are five stages of puberty. And the period actually happens at the end of, uh, of the puberty process, at the fourth stage. So breasts develop, pubic hair grows, all of these secondary characteristics, uh, the body shape changes by Tanner stage two and three. By Tanner stage four, that's when puberty happens. And once that happens, all that's left is for gaining fat. Uh, the, the female gains fat at that stage of, of puberty and grows in height. So she might get slightly larger breasts, slightly larger hips, and more fat, but the 90% of puberty has already occurred by the period. And then you have girls 
4% of girls who are getting their period at uh, four, age four. So even that kind of far-fetched explanation from Ezekiel still uh, would be in favor or advocating child marriage according to your definition. Do you think that you, you don't develop your breast as a girl until you're 18 years old? <laughs> like that's, that's ridiculous. So even according to the Bible argument that you painstakingly laid out for us, that, that passage would be in favor or endorsing child marriage according to your definition because you've arbitrarily set it so high at 18. Like why, like you're so concerned about moral arguments, why is 18 the line? Like what is so special about 18 that no one in history has ever, uh, prior to industrialization, prior to these mandatory age limits, prior to this idea that we have to go to through 12, 12 grades before we're fully mature, before we're fully adults. Like wh where does that come from? You haven't provided an explanation for that. Uh, why there's this radical shift. My explanation is very clear. There's industrialization, there's feminism, and that is what has, over the past 300 years, created these taboos of child marriage that you can't find anyone else express. Like, isn't this bizarre to you? Like, isn't this such a big red flag that what you're describing as this kind of objective moral principle is not actually very objective or universal? Like, especially like for Christians to say this. Like, <laughs> because your Bible seems to endorse it, your prophets in the Old Testament seem to endorse it, Jesus has nothing to say to condemn it. Canon law, canon law has a minimum age of marriage of 12. So are you going to condemn canon law? Are you going to condemn the church fathers? Are you going to condemn all of those? Okay, yeah, you're shaking your head, yeah. So you're repudiating your entire religious tradition. So how do you even know what the Old Testament or the New Testament is, or the Old Testament for that matter? It was passed down by these pedophiles, according to you. These reprobate, reprobates seconds. that you are condemning right now, they're the ones who, are they morally uh, capable to transmit revelation if you're, they're pedophiles, according to you? And time. We are going to jump into the cross-examination. This is where each speaker will, be get, will get the opportunity to ask questions of the other speaker. We're going to start with Mike asking questions to Daniel. And ideally, this is strictly questions and then strictly answers from Daniel. Yep. Mike, the floor is all yours. Okay, Daniel, I've, not, I've noticed a lack of studies in your opening statement in rebuttal. Do you have any studies that speak of anything good coming out of child marriage? So child marriage is something that is so taboo that no such study could be published. So that's okay. a find no? A, find me a, find, no, there is, I am not aware of a study that is advocating child marriage because it's illegal. Okay. It's something that's illegal in Western society because of the mandatory schooling ages. So are there are no studies that can get funding to, to advocate something that's illegal. Are you aware that most of these studies, and many I cited, were actually done in places like India or Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East? Those studies are funded in the West by Western universities. Uh, you mentioned the period comes at the end of puberty. Are you saying someone can marry and have sex with someone prior to getting their period? So according to Islamic law, when the body is fully formed because of puberty, uh, the period comes at Tanner stage four, which is the end of puberty. So yes, when there are signs of physical maturity, um, then it becomes permissible for the husband in Islamic law to have marital relationships or consummate the relation with his bride. And this is the example of the prophet, peace be upon him, before who married age, six. Before the age of monarchy, that's what I'm trying to get. The, before the period. Okay, I, I thought your argument originally was, this is about maximizing for fertility. Uh, that's why we need to have child marriages. How can you maximize for fertility before a girl is ovulating and menstruating if it's years before then? Why can you telling me that what I'm trying to get at and trying to ask is like, so you can have sex, marry and have sex with a girl years before she has her period. If that's the case, how is this about maximizing fertility and not about just sadistic pleasure? Well, I didn't make a, a argument about maximizing fertility, but I'll still give you the courtesy of addressing your question. Um, evolution, what evolutionary biologists suggest, like David Buss, is that this kind of attraction and wanting to, because they've done studies where they show body outlines uh, without ages of females, and they show a body outline, like a silhouette of a female at age 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and they ask uh, adult men, which body type do you find most attractive? The men don't know what the ages are, they just see the silhouette. And when you tally all of the responses, the most popular or the most attractive silhouette body shape is of a 14 year old. <laughs> so that's something that is ev explained evolutionarily. I don't believe in evolution, I know that you do, mm -hmm. but they explain it that this 
is an adaptation because if you can start uh, fertilizing a female as soon as she becomes, as soon as she's showing signs of an imminent um, fertility, the period, menarche, then that will maximize because you secured the female right at the beginning, the start of when she will potentially. But you can still have sex before you start maximizing fertility, right? When the body is physically okay. mature, according to Islamic law. Do you know law. what precocious puberty is? Yes, I do. Okay, what is it? It means going, starting puberty uh, unusually early, like okay. Can beyond you have, averages. Is there anything in Islam that prevents you from, you know, man marrying a five-year-old that started precocious puberty? No, marriage can happen, uh, like you can arrange a marriage even as an infant, but that doesn't mean that sex is allowed. But could, could, a, uh, could a man have a marriage to a five-year-old consummated if she started precocious puberty? If she starts showing signs of physical maturity, then yes, that's permissible, as I stated. That's what about the age four? If there are signs Three. of... So this is something that becomes biologically impossible because precocious I puberty, have a there are shows no... It goes as early as 11 months. All right, well, that's something that the parents would not... Uh, the, see, the thing about Islamic marriage is that parents are involved at these ages. And when you look at the pr marriage of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to Aisha, uh, her parents were involved. And so she was not living with the Prophet, peace be upon him, even though she was married to him. So the parents have oversight. And sometimes a qadi or a judge can have oversight if the guardians are not capable to make sure that the rights and the physical well-being of a child are not, or a minor are not harmed by that marriage. What, what about, because you've tried to justify uh, sexual slavery after a war. So what if a man finds a, a seven-year-old, let's say, started her period, could he take her back as a sex slave? So that's a whole different debate on um, slavery and concubinage. I'm just talking about the minor aspect. Would that be fine? Yeah, so the, if a girl is uh, any age, she can be taken as a sex a slave. slave, right? Yeah, as opposed to being left to die after war. So women can't take care of themselves. They would need to be taken by the men because they're too capable of caring for themselves. Only the about kids. 10 seconds left. Yeah, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old. Not talking about the women capable. and the children. Yeah, this is the topic of sex slavery, which is also endorsed in the Old Testament and practiced by Moses uh, and other prophets like Joshua. So that is a practice found within uh, the Bible, it's found within Islam, within the Quran, and it's practiced, again, universally. And so I'll give you a chance to wrap up that sentence and then we gotta go to the next portion. Yeah, so if you want to condemn Islam for these kinds of practices, you have to condemn Christianity and your entire religious tradition for exactly the same practices, if not worse. So I don't see the logic of this. We'll jump to Daniel asking questions of Mike. This is gonna be five minutes as well. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Right, do you think fornication is prohibited? No. So you're, you think fornication is allowed by God? Oh, no, you, sorry, I misunderstood. No, I do not think fornication should happen. Okay, so God has prohibited fornication. Yeah. Yes? Okay, clearly in the Bible. Now, sex outside of marriage is wrong. And it's condemned by God? It is condemned by God. Okay, so which scenario is more immoral? Okay, I'm gonna give you two scenarios. Scenario one, a 10-year-old girl who has completed puberty gets legally married with the consent of her parents to a good believing Christian man who is 25 years old. That's scenario one. Scenario two, a 10 year old girl has a 10 year old boyfriend and they fornicate whenever they want. Which is more immoral? I don't have to answer that because that's an either or situation. I say they're no, both No, one or the other. Which one is more no, immoral? No, both are immoral. Which one is more both immoral? Both are immoral, <laughs> Daniel. So, okay, so, okay, so fornication. So fornication is happening rampantly. Do you, have, do, you want, do you have the same kind of feelings of that being evil and wanting to stop it and you put that big uh, slide about Christians are going to stand against trauma. I can also put a uh, slide up that says uh, Christians are going to stand against fornication that's happening rampant throughout society. Yes, we condemn it. Where? I'm condemning it right now. Hear me. I'm okay. condemning it. So, but you, you didn't think that was more immoral, the child marriage scenario was not more immoral than the fornication. We're debating child marriage and I'm pointing out it's immoral. I can also agree fornication So you did not, immoral. you did not say that was more immoral. Okay, got it. I have so no reason to, to say one or more. According, well, according to the Bible, you do have a reason to say it because the Bible explicitly condemns sex out of marriage, but it has nothing to say about child marriage. According to some Christian sources, Jesus' mother, mother was either 12 or 14 when married to Joseph. When it comes to child marriage, what do you think is more likely? 
Option one, Jesus held views similar to those found in the society of his time and thus had no objection to child marriage. Or option two, Jesus held views similar to the United States in 2023 and thus viewed child marriage as very evil. Which one is more likely? Again, I quoted scholars like Michael Satlow that argued the average age was not 13, especially in Palestine. They was, were is there any pre-modern scholar who has this opinion? Yeah, Seranus of Ephesus, as I cited in my opening statement, Giles of Rome. What did, what did he say? Repeat what he said. All right, I'll go to uh, Seranus of Ephesus, as you want. Let me pull up his quote here. Seranus of Ephesus. He says, okay, so this, within regard to the birth passage, difficult labor takes place when the uterus is either a narrow orifice or a small one or a small neck. He goes on to say, a small orifice or a small neck occurs for many reasons, for it obtains what, whenever women married before maturity conceive and give birth, while the uterus is not fully grown, grown or fundus of the uterus expanded. Where's, so, the, where's that condemnation of marrying before 18? He is or having basically sex before going 18? on and saying that these are problems when there's a small orifice that results in no, problems. No, no, that, so now you're making the descriptive prescriptive error, because where is that prohibiting or speaking out or condemning child marriage. He we didn't see that in that reference. So is there any other pre-modern scholar who condemns child marriage? Again, I quoted Kim Phillips' book, Albertus Magnus. They're, they're not pre-modern scholars. Where is the citation? They're writing in the 1300s. Find me a quote. What is a quote from a scholar that says child marriage is wrong, not a descriptive okay, statement? Okay, you're asking me to give you exact wording, yet I can quote them basically condemning it in their own words or talking about the harms of it. Where? Read Same it. Thing. Read it for me. Again, I quoted, for example, uh, Kim Phillips's book. She says, Albertus Magnus stated that while the physical changes associated with puberty enabled boys and girls to feel desire and enter sexual relations, the seed in both parties were either too weak or not admitted, so the weak offspring nonetheless were, all, were a result. The notion that intercourse and childbearing at too early an age had de deteriorous effects and had great authority. However, in some views of Aristotle, transmitted by Gauss of Rome and they were then translated by yada yada John of English. She goes on to say, uh, the knowing of women uh, in kind and childing condemn marriage, condemn sex before 15, for example. She quotes, again, Albertus Magnus, Gauss of Again, none of, that, none of what you quoted was a condemnation of child marriage. Listen, yeah, I'm, there are deleterious effects for that could, there are more likelihood of complication at that age, com, but you also have more complications at age 40 or 50. So, so are, is that just as uh, immoral? The medical experts say that's not a comparison. And again, Where? Which I experts? can talk about, I can, Which I can know. We, you cited mortality and you cited uh, uterine uh, tears. Those are just as likely at age 50. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, I, cite, not. I can cite you that. Well, I can pull cite up the well. National Health Institute and we can show you exactly the charts that show that. Improvement. My opening statement literally had studies showing that no, it is not. It is fu much much more, it's five times more likely under the age of 15. You compared, you compared 15 to 25. You didn't compare 15 to 50 or 45. Age 40, a woman at age 45 having a child is also very highly likely to get okay, then they uterine shares. Okay, then they should probably retire at that point. What's your point? It still but your argument implies that that is as immoral as child marriage. <laughs> having a child at that age, if it's gonna cause those kind of problems, but does it cause the psychiatric problems I mentioned? Does it cause the high rates of So, so, you, gotta, so, you, so you find it, so you would find interrupt. it just as immoral. I can, I can give you a chance to finish this question that you just started, Daniel, and I'll give Mike you a chance okay. to respond. That's it. No, I have okay. another question. I can, so I'll, I'll see I can time. condemn child marriage because, again, I gave a cumulative case from all sorts of problems it causes. Yeah, and all the, things that, you call, all the things that you cited have, full, have holes in them. I do have to, we have to, I have like to go to the no next portion. Like there is no pre scholar that actually condemns child marriage. All of the citations that you just read show that they're making medical descriptions. They're not condemning. They're not saying this is immoral. So you're making the same descriptive, prescriptive fallacy that you accuse me of. I'll give you a chance to respond, Mike, as this is open dialogue time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, I was going to cite the medical experts' moral treatises on this issue, and the medical experts all agree this is harmful. So again, I'm making a evidentiary type argument where I say, look at all the evidence showing this. And again, we see this reflected in the society. Kim, Phil Kim Phillips, again, in her book, Medieval Maidens, points out that there was a lot of people concerned with having children too young. She cites kings and different rulers, different barons, basically saying, please wait until my daughter is this age before the marriage is consummated. So at one point, this girl Elizabeth, she cites in her book, was married young, but her father says you cannot consummate the marriage until after 16. A king um, over Aragorn, said I have to wait till after 18, for example. So there was this concern, and they were basically trying to up the age at that point. Wait, at what point were they up, upping the age? In the Middle Ages, medieval period. Yeah, they uh, settled on the age 12. 
That, that was the minimum no, age. No, Kim Phillips That's says a canon, canon law, law is not a good representation of that. She <laughs> says canon law is a very limited understanding of what was going on. It's like today citing that in well, that was, So cite me an, another example of a law that prohibited marriage. I never said it was necessarily prohibited. I'm citing okay. cultural aspects. Okay, the, so the that's, is that's not, my point. There was, the it debate, was not prohibited. The debate is not, did people in the Middle Ages allow child marriage? I agreed in my opening statement, yes, they did. And it was still harmful when they did. And a lot of people at the same time were like, hey, maybe we should up the age. And they were encouraging girls to wait many more years. Yeah, but the, the, the debate is about the acceptability and the morality. So you have to explain why is 99% of humanity engaged in this grave, grave evil. That's how, why is 1% of humanity in the modern period, magically, only within the past 300 years, suddenly dis discovering, oh, this is such a tr terrible, traumatic thing. This is so evil. There's so much harm coming from it. When you cite medical experts, for example, this is an important point, and you say that, oh, well, there is these harms that come from uh, sexual relations with minors at the age of puberty or right around that age of pubescence, those are likelihoods. When you say morbidity, mortality, those are likelihoods. And if you're going to pin your argument on medical harm, then there are all kinds of sexual behaviors that cause medical harm. I cited having uh, sex or being pregnant and having children with women over 35, over 40, over 50. Those are also extremely harmful. So if we take your moral argument, all of those kinds of sexual acts and reproduction should be also outlawed and should also be considered a grave moral evil. What about sodomy? What about, uh, you should be in favor of laws that ban, okay. Can I ban all of those practices. Can I respond to yeah, two things ahead. there? For one, you said, uh, why should we not ban it if it's harmful? And the other one was like, it's been put so pervasive in cultures. Well, again, let's go to your own source, Bruce Ryan, who noted that there was, he's got, he's got four pages of homosexual interaction between men and boys happening in cultures around the world for generations. Well, I can just say the same thing to you. If 99% of cultures before Western, including, Those, it, let me finish, including Islamic societies, were all okay with it, why don't we just let it go rampant again? We know it's harmful, according to Bruce Islamic Ryan. societies did not consider uh, sexual relations between men and boys as acceptable. They did condemn it. They, Bruce they, Ryan, they considered it a grave evil. Bruce Ryan quite quotes the silence. It was practiced, yes, Libya. of course it was practiced. Yeah. And yeah, there was poetry about it, but that was seen as a perversion That's and heresy. That's my point. My you're, point. Ignorant, you're ignorant about Islamic history. That's not Islam has a, a complete rejection and prohibition okay. of any you kind of homosexual behavior. Respond to some of these points. But you're making this claim that you're is nonsense. Let me respond. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, my point was not that Islam did not condemn it. I agree Islam condemned it. I quoted Bruce Ryan saying that. My point was, again, you're saying that child marriage was so pervasive, therefore, what's wrong with it? Well, again, homosexual hemophilic interaction was just as pervasive according to your own source. It so was, why where does it say that's more pervasive? One, where does it say that was equally pervasive? Where does he, it say that? He literally says this throughout his page. Look, this is child marriage pages. is as pervasive as- He does not bring up child marriage. <laughs> then what comparison are you making? Then? You're the one who quoted Bruce Ryan. Yeah, in a different context for a different purpose. You cited Bruce it in your opening statement. Bru yeah, but I didn't make that point. Bruce, I'm not saying everything Bruce Ryan has ever said is correct. I'm saying this meta study that Bruce Ryan did with you know, others showed that the sexual act between a minor and a, an adult is not inherently traumatic. It doesn't inherently cause psychological False. trauma. Yeah, I'll read you, I'll read you the uh, abstract since this is a point of dispute. I have the actual study, I can read from that. Yeah, let's, it's a, it suffices to read the abstract. Page seven, child sexual abuse researchers have repeatedly maintained that hemophilic interactions are innately and intensely harmful for the younger person. That's what he's disputing, that's what the study No, that's what he's saying, it's true. No. Look, many, here's what it says. Many lay persons and professionals believe that child sexual abuse causes intense harm, regardless of gender, pervasively in the general population. The authors examined this belief by reviewing 59 studies based on college samples. Meta-analyses revealed that students with this kind of child sexual abuse were on average slightly well, less well adjusted than controls. However, this poor adjustment could not be attributed to the sexual interaction because family environment was consistently confounded with that behavior. Family environment explained considerably more adjustment variance than the actual sexual act. So what he's saying, to summarize, is that you can't, you can't isolate the sexual act. 
what's happening is children are getting molested, children are getting uh, you know, abused by their family members or in this bad environment, and that bad environment or this abusive parent, that's what's causing the slightly lower adjustment levels or the trauma. It's not the sex itself, it's not the sexual act itself. And, he, and again, Rind is not looking at marriage. He's not looking at these kinds of relationships that have existed, again, throughout history. You're right. He's not looking at child marriage, so I don't know why you've been citing it for four years. But again, he says, what he's saying in his paper is that it's not harmful to the active partner. It's not a disorder. It's not like schizophrenia. Not but this he study. does say not it this, is where did, where did Where did this study mention the active partner? The abstract that I just read. You've got to read the actual study. You're not says even, on are you studying seven, the same study? What's your study? It's the Tromovich, Ryan Tromovich and Brosserman. Yeah, I'm citing the 1998. No, 1998 one? Yeah. Okay, I'm citing the one you said in your Harris Sultan one. Now the problem. Why are you debating a previous debate? Like because debate I'm, me in this debate. You bring up stuff that you, your opponent has cited. That's how you prepare, Daniel. Now the problem no, with that study is it's an outlier. What he brings in the opening statement. That that's what you should you debate. That study you cited is an outlier. Anna Sattler notes their try their findings in her book Predators. Uh, she notes that their findings are truly an outlier, and she cites numerous other meta-analysis that have found other results. A meta-analysis of the relationship of child sexual abuse to adult psychological adjustments from 1995. The long-term sequel of childhood sexual abuse in women, a meta-analytical review from 1996. A meta-analysis of the published research on the effects of child sexual abuse, as well as the pre prevalence of child sexual abuse in communities and student samples. Furthermore, Ryan even says in that 1998 meta-analysis that it was actually harmful to the girls. It wasn't harmful to the boys, is his, his argument. And he is still an outlier. So the a, a irony of this is, again, your own study surprising. says it is harmful to the girls. Ryan is saying that in 1998. He's saying that the harm is caused by the family environment. He's saying just the girls the report abstract. harm in the 1998 meta-analysis. Yeah, there, and he attributes that. He does a correlation analysis, and he finds that it's more correlated with the family environment as opposed to the sexual act. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why this study was so controversial. That's why it was one And an outlier. Yeah, of course it's an outlier because look at the stigma. Like, look at the social stigma. Like, if you want to live and die by these psychological studies, then all the psychological studies right now say that, like, the dominant studies all say that if a child at age four uh, a boy feels like he's a, actually a girl, then he should be put on hormone blockers and perhaps even get sex change surgery. So do you accept that? Do you agree that psychological conclusion? No, I think there's actually Why? research that challenged that. But again, we're Where? talking about the, the, Do you disagree that the dominant research says that uh, I do not agree gender that the dominant affirming, research says that. Gender affirming care is necessary for... Okay, so you disagree. So in some cases, the dominant research can be false I get, and very wrong, right? A, what's the evidence that's the dominant research? What studies? Okay, so you you're disputing that the dominant research today in psychology says that gender affirming care should be provided to children as young as four years or three years old. You're, you're denying that. If you're doubting research, why are you even citing Bruce Ryan to begin with? Are you just cherry picking the ones that support your view? I mean, you could just say, no. we well, could just doubt it when it's you useful for us or I'll just pick Bruce no, I'm just useful. I'm just countering the point that you made that whatever is the dominant claim about a certain topic then we should just take that and ignore well, other kinds of factors. I'm not making a simple like all you're doing is caricaturing my arguments like oh Daniel says that child marriage was common therefore it's okay. Like that's not my argument. You're then caricaturing your your argument, argument that it is okay. My argument is a challenge to anyone who claims that it's not okay to explain why the attitudes shift, shifted so radically. One of the reasons why the attitudes changed so radically is because of industrialization, is because of feminism. That explains the radical shift, not something inherent. What study shows what's, that? Many studies. Look at what look study at this. shows that the reason we started condemning child marriage was not because of the medical. The anthropology I of childhood by David yeah, Lancey. Discovery and invention in the history of adolescence, published in the Journal of Adolescent Health. Uh, Children and adolescents as sexual beings: a historical overview by Vern Bullo, 2004. How many more studies do you want? Okay. Where All of these studies say, show that these practices were pervasive. You All you did to respond to that is, oh, the average age was 22 at a certain point in Europe. Like that's again, that's your counter. My question was, where does the evidence? Where do, what's, do these studies say the reason we started condemning child marriage was because of industrialism and feminism? Do yes. they say that? Yes. Read them. I cited because Montesquieu. I the, the the first um, Western 
expression against child marriage happened in 1748 with Montesquieu. Because again, I have medical experts saying the reason it should not be practiced is because of all the harm it causes. Mental, physical, emotional, sexual. We, we talk about every single factor and, and it's your arguments don't make any sense. Like what? Like the fact that, okay, there's some likelihood of physical harm, like 2% uh, chance of mortality for a child at age 12 or 10, you have the same mortality rate for a woman over 40. No, girls to ages 10 <laughs> But you have no problem, you, you have no problem with women over 40 having sex. No, if they're gonna cause problems and the medical experts are telling them not to have children, they should listen to the medical experts. I'm well, perfectly consistent If there were a that. taboo against women over 40 having sex, I bet the medical experts would say, oh, look at the mortality rate is uh, the same for 12-year-old and 40-year-old, so therefore both should be condemned. Most but you don't see that. are basically hitting menopause, and so they can have sex just fine in their marriage without risking that kind of thing. Well, we're talking about women who get pregnant, so okay. they haven't well, hit menopause. Their, medical their risk expert. of mortality, the normalized risk of mortality for those women is higher than, than women if who are If your doctor tells them not puberty. to, then they shouldn't. Quite yeah. simple. Okay, but why are doctors condemning one type? Do you think it could be, uh, why are doctors condemning one side of the spectrum? Could it be because of social stigma? Because of being illegal? No, it's because of the medical Because your argument like basically boils down to medical researcher, child marriage is immoral because it's illegal. No, That's it's, begging the question. We're asking why is it illegal? Why is there a social it stigma? It causes severe mental and physical harm. Increase. Where's the evidence for that? Did you pay attention? The physical harm, whenever I cite, you keep repeating physical harm, and I say the same kind of physical harm occurs with women who are over a certain age. And then you hand wave that and say, oh, well, but that's, doctors aren't talking about women over 40. Well, Again, why not? If a doctor tells a woman over 40 she should not have children because it can increase her risk of death, no, why? Injury, you're changing no, the scenario. She should not, have, she should should not be having a child. Why are doctors writing so much about mortality at this bottom end of the age spectrum, but not at the top age of the age spectrum? That's what you, you're not explaining. I have an explanation. It's because of the social stigma. Okay, because again, the research shows that women at this age, they're still psychologically and emotionally developing. When you force them into marriages too young, they have increased anxiety, depression, psychiatric disorders, increased risk of suicide. They're more likely to die. They can't raise children properly because they've not been educated enough. They've not been able to mentally mature enough. So again, the studies I'm citing show you have an increased risk of death for even their offspring and how they're raised up to the age of five. The rate of psychological maturity is also very contextual. It's very environmental. Children who are, or women at age, or, 12-year-olds in Africa or 10-year-olds in Africa today are considered adults. Like this category of adolescence is something that is a modern Western construct. The research I cited was done in Africa. Yeah, I know. So that's that kind of stigma that's attached from the West, that is what affects these health outcomes. Then why do they have the same problems in there? Like why do they have the same problems? What problems? The higher rates of depression, suicide, mental disorders, psychiatric issues, they're all having these. And in fact, we also see increased increased risk of intimate partner violence. Again, I need to see like what those studies are because there is such a huge bias with the UN and li global liberalism that is imposing this kind of. You heard it here, first, folks. It's child. a conspiracy. Oh yeah, because liberal powers have never conspired to impose their values on the rest of the world. Yeah, right? well, we because the liberal because the liberal West never made up stories about children being abused in Afghanistan to justify bombing them or going these... to war, invading Iraq because of the weapons of mass destruction that we know uh, Saddam Hussein have. The West never has any kind of conspiracy theory to go and invade and bomb and colonize and take over Muslim or non-Muslim lands. So right? all my studies That's are conspiracy. All, <laughs> all my studies are conspiracy. I, I cited so many studies that go directly contradictory to the things that you what cited. Studies did you cite mention child marriage? Modern studies on the effects of it today. I'm, we'll read them again. The I Anthropology like of Childhood by David Lancy. Discovery and Invention in the History of Adolescence. History. Journal of Adolescence. Yeah, today is part of history. I, I'm talking the about historical study that is a, it, progression. You can't, get, you can't get funding to show, can you get funding to show that child marriage is a great thing? Well, probably, yeah, outside of the U.S. in certain countries, but they all find no, harmful well, effects. Outside of the U.S., you don't have research, in, research universities. All of the research universities in the Muslim world, for example, are funded by Western grants. 
So no, and, and they're, and those, so and they're deputized, and those universities are deputized to push UN standards, Western liberal standards. So you think there was a massive scientific conspiracy to fund institutions around the world to show do child marriage is harmful? Do, do you know, do you realize that there are all kinds of research, again, that shows that gender affirming care needs to be given to children at uh, age four? Yes, so find me contested. No, the dominant, the dominant research shows that you need to give this gender affirming care to children as young as four. And increasingly, you're not gonna find any studies that contradict this, why? It's because of a conspiracy. Two reasons, one, there is research that can test that, and one, this is a very recent thing, it's not been studied that much. Child marriage has been practiced and studied for decades. We know the effects, you're comparing apples it's been to oranges. Taboo. It's been taboo and it's been illegal for centuries in the West. Yeah, good thing, because of all the harm it causes. No, the harm it causes is also something, it's a, again, the same kind of thing with the harm that's caused by preventing a child from exploring his gender sexuality and gender fluidity. That's the harm that's being caused. Again, you're comparing apples to oranges. No, it's the same exact thing. No. The, the dominant research today says that's harmful, and those studies, like the, counter, the contradictory studies that you're saying, oh no, children shouldn't be exploring their gender at age four, those are transphobic studies, and they have to be condemned. And those professors that have those studies are being uh, so we pushed should, out of their department. So you're basically saying it's wrong just to dismiss. Do you think that's study? happening? Do you think so that's happening? I'm or trying not? to ask you a question, sir. Well, I'm. I, I, again, I'm asking you a question. Again, do you think so that's you the think case? Do you think there's studies, any pressure? Do you think there's any pressure on professors who say that gender affirming care should not be given to kindergartners? Is, again, are they facing any pressure? Yes again, or no? So you're say, basically saying the studies that they're they're arguing that it, this is wrong are basically being dismissed as transphobic and that's bad. You seem to be doing the same thing. You're just dismissing my studies that I said as a Western conspiracy. Why? Do you get to dismiss all the studies you want as a Western conspiracy, but it's bad to uh, dismiss other fo studies as transphobic. No, I'm not dismissing those studies. I'm just showing the dynamics within um, these kinds of departments, within universities, and what you're describing as a conspiracy. Yeah, conspiracies do happen. Things that are socially taboo, like right now there's a new social taboo that you should not prohibit children from exploring their gender fluidity. That is the dominant status quo now, increasingly. And I'm saying that the status quo is sometimes very wrong. Right. Just like there's, a, there's been a status quo because of, the Western, because of Western dominance against child marriage, minor marriage. The mere existence of you, a you, Someone like you prefers children to fornicate to their heart's content That's as a, opposed to get married. That's a false dichotomy, sir. Uh, false dichotomy, so let's get that. You're, so you're girls trying to say the mere existence of a conspiracy. like. You know, there, the moon landing is a conspiracy, and we all accept the moon landing happened. I mean, we know that's nonsense to deny the moon landing. We know just because there's a mere existence of a conspiracy is not evidence the conspiracy is true. You're just stating there's a conspiracy against child marriage. That doesn't make it magically the case that child marriage is okay. Just like we know the moon landing happened, right? No, I'm just citing, because you're making a big point about how there's no studies that show the benefits of child marriage. And no. I'm saying, yeah, no, duh, no, because it's something are. that is a stigma. It's no, something that's illegal. Are. There huh? are. If you look at the systematic reviews, there are outlier studies. So, so a lot of times these researchers, if you read a lot of the studies I cited, will say, yeah, there was like 15 studies that showed that child marriage correlates with intimate partner violence, and one found no correlation. So there are studies that always are outside of the outlier. For example, I could cite a meta-analysis right now on religiosity and depression, 444 studies. Okay, 6% actually show a, a positive correlation between religiosity and depression, but 6% is still the outlier. In these studies, in these reviews, you can find outliers. Every now and then you'll come across a researcher that'll be like, okay, so in this study we found child marriage was mentally harmful so, in this so then way. So that's a wash. But then it's a wash. Then why are you staking so much of your claim on these studies? You're acknowledging that there are outliers, and you're acknowledging that sometimes it's the outliers that are correct, and the dominant status quo is incorrect. You need to show evidence so why are you correct. My argument wasn't based on showing that there are studies that prove that this is psychological, psychologically beneficial. That wasn't my argument. Well, my argument should, was, my marriage? argument again, was that this is a, childhood sexuality is a reality. Yeah. Your only response has been abstinence. You should just control yourself until you're 18. Yeah. You think, yeah, so this is a failed model. This does not work. You can't have ch children, teenagers with raging hormones, practice abstinence 
That's why we so, see such high levels of fornication, which according to, in, in the cross-examination, is as bad as child marriage. I didn't say what's bad, I said they're both bad. I don't have to give them numbers or rates. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to say which one is worse. That's because, convenient. Again, That's well, convenient. because I'm a virtue ethicist and we don't do that kind of thing. So, so, but the point is that you can't condemn fornication that's happening rampantly. Yes, I can. And you have no solution for that kind of child, uh, for that kind of behavior My solution, among children. again, is not putting out a, a kitchen in the fire by breaking the dam and flooding the neighborhood. What you is don't the solve solution? a problem with a problem. Well, what is? Stop, stop uh, grandstanding the, the and tell us the solution. A better solution would be increased religiosity, more education, uh, more extra what education? activities. Sex well, education? Education does show that there is a, a, a better understanding of sexual activity, and it does prevent uh, the decreased sort of fornication of this because people start making better decisions in their life. So there is no actual evidence that shows that this works. There's no evidence that shows that abstinence is something that you know, has reduced fornication, cool. reduced the levels of um, child pregnancy Do or you teenage think pregnancy. Child marriages re would reduce premarital sex. Yes. Wait, but your own study for, for, for um, Adam, you know, your last debate with Nerea? You cited a study no, no, from Adam. Talk about this Amy. debate. Don't bring up my previous <laughs> no, no, debates. No, 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 because I'm, your I'm glad that you've watched all my debates. I say But let's talk study. about the studies in this debate. Okay, let me cite a study then on this whole issue. You, Amy Adamzik, Religion and Sexual Behavior, notes that in Islamic societies, which you cited last time, notes they have lower premarital sex. However, er, an earlier age at marriage does not appear to explain the relationship. So, Earlier marriage did not decrease premarital sex, according to your own stu study that you cited last time. She says, what about child marriage? She, okay, so I'll read you directly from, uh, see, we find that, uh, we find that ever, that we find that ever married Hindus and Muslims are less likely to report having premarital sex than uh, ever married Jews and Christians. In an earlier age in marriage does not appear to explain the relationship. So marrying as a child or as early marriage did not decrease pre premarital sex. Also, I left out an important detail in a lot of the studies I cited. Child marriage correlates with an increase in STDs, cervical cancer. That's, but the rates are much lower No, in Muslim countries, yes. Adam Zick is the one who cites that. Yes, but again, child marriages correlate how does with she STDs. Define, how does she define child marriage? Because the age of consent is much lower in Muslim countries, number one. And number two, no, I agree that there is an entire culture that prevents promiscuity, mm -hmm. there, but, but marriage and chastity are encouraged in Islam. Gender roles are encouraged in Islam by law, by law and by custom. But those things don't exist in the free liberal West, in this, you know, the, the, the countries that are blessed by Protestant Christianity. So are you advocating the same kind of restrictions on like uh, gender mixing? Are you advocating for hijab? Are you advocating for all of these kinds of Islamic solutions to prevent the kind of child fornication that is so rampant in society? They said they didn't explain their relationship. My point is, is that early marriage, child marriage, did not cause a decrease in premarital sex. So you can have an Islamic society without early child marriage and still decrease it. You can have a orthodox traditional Christian society with uh, low premarital sex without encouraging child or minor marriage. Also, again, in the studies I cited in my opening statement, what comes up a lot is an increase in STDs among the relationships where one is a child, typically the girl, because that's typically no, what child's molestation, yeah. because yeah. it's stigmatized. STDs. Because so marriage is, is stigmatized, so, so people STDs are diddling are being kids increased in the closet. Of child marriages. That's more promiscuous. Child marriages or child sex? Because you're, child saying, you're equivocating. Child marriages. The studies I cited show that there is an increase in STDs when a child marriage, when, child, when a society is aligned Which for countries? child marriage. Muslim countries? Sub-Saharan African countries, yeah, Bangladesh. So Sub-Saharan. Sub Bangladesh. Those are the ones they were looked at. Child marriage increases STDs. STDs. Bangladesh has low, extremely low STDs. Not among the child marriages. Also in India is, as well. What is the study? You're saying things that I've never heard before. Okay. That go me. contrary to all of this other evidence. So the study is reproductive, uh, re I put it in my opening statement, reproductive health, reproductive and sexual health consequences of child marriage, a review of the literature. And they say in this, they say that here's the results. Child marriage as a result of poverty has many adverse consequences on reproductive and sexual health of girls. These include death during childbirth, physical and sexual violence, isolation, depression, cervical cancer, a risk of sexually transmitted diseases. Teen pregnant women are at a high risk of preterm birth as well as neonatal death more than other women. Look, look the, the thing with STDs, with um, all these kinds of uh, problems that come, uh, that you're citing, preventing harms 
at this level, psychological harm, etc. It comes at a, grand, a, a macro level. There's an entire system that Islam endorses of patriarchy, gender roles, chastity, high fertility, loyalty to the husband. These are all values that Islam as a whole endorses. And these are the, all things that are being attacked by uh, liberal modernity, which liberal Christians like you endorse and support. And that's the problem. Yeah, if your solution for uh, this dilemma that I pose for you of child fornication is just adopt all of these Islamic values or adopt patriarchy, adopt, but that's what you're implying by saying that there are Muslim countries who have low rates of uh, premarital sex without child marriage. Right. So how are they preventing premarital sex? I'm giving you the answer. It's because of all of these other patriarchal values. I am perfectly so that's, fine. So what, what is your solution? I am perfectly fine with saying that Islam has some good things in it. I've never denied that. Again, I wanted to read another study uh, before. But those good things are okay. solving the problem that you're not able to solve, that no okay. Christian, health modern Christian is able to solve. Health that's consequences the of child marriage in Africa says, a common belief is that child marriage protects girls from promiscuity and therefore disease. The reality is quite different. Married girls are more likely than unmarried girls to become infected with STDs, in particular HIV. So this idea you've been arguing that somehow we need to have child marriage is going to reduce promiscuity. You're not Let me about finish my sentence. Though. This idea that you're promoting that we need to allow child marriage because this can prevent fornication and promiscuity in the West is false. We see an increase in STDs. We see an increase in uh, HIV, cervical cancer. That's what these studies I cited are kind of going over. Sub-Saharan Africa is notorious for HIV. It's notorious for child rape. It's notorious for all kinds of war. And by the way, Sub-Saharan Africa is Christian. Uh, there is a huge disparity between Muslim Africa and Christian Africa when it comes to HIV specifically and STDs. So you are citing very biased uh, or, or non-representative studies when you're citing Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are Christian Africans, not Muslim Africans. Muslims are in North Africa, not in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, I know. I'm citing, I'm pointing this out to show you how bad child marriage is. You're the one saying child marriage is great, it's gonna lower fornication. No, I didn't say that, that child, mar I did not say that child marriage is the magic bullet that is going to solve fornication. But it's definitely a factor as a part of an entire system of patriarchy and gender norms and chastity that liberal Christians like you are opposed to. And again, your own study shows that early child marriage does not help to reduce premarital sex. It did not mediate it in Amy Adams' study. Nothing showed study. that. You cited Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, that's not a Muslim, those study. aren't Muslim countries. I'm going back to Amy's study. Yeah, and Amy I, I explained the Adams' Zick study that it's not just, again, child marriage that prevents the premarital uh, They say sex. it prevents nothing. It's not even, it doesn't mediate the relationship at all. Yeah, because it's banned. It's outlawed. In Muslim countries, it's banned as well. Not in the country she was looking at. Where does she, she say that? Let me pull it up. Then. All of these Muslim countries are under UN international law where child marriage is banned. It's a human rights violation. It still is practiced in a lot of these countries. Like okay, Niger, so if, if it's practiced, okay, then it's practiced, then that would be the explanation for why there's lower rates of premarital she sex. She says that's not. This is that exactly. It's not so that's, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. No, I'm pointing I'm out, pointing what out that it's, says. it's illegal. Just because something's illegal doesn't mean it's not practiced. Yeah, they do so lots of where things was, that are legal. Where was her analysis that child marriage specifically did not reduce premarital sex? In how, all how of was the countries she looked at. How was she able to determine that? The countries she looked at were Nigeria, Chad, Guinea, Mali, uh, uh, Niger, uh, Azerbaijan, Nambia, Moldova, Haiti, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Ukraine, excuse me, Madagascar, Cambodia, Congo, where, where does she say? Where does she say that child marriage did not prevent premarital sex? I already quoted it for you. What was her explanation, though? The relation. The, the point is, is that when they and you can the read box, the explanation, it does not mediate it. So she said there is no. The, the explanation is child marriage or early marriage did not mediate a relationship that reduced premarital sex. Where where is she making a causal claim that the it does not cause less? That does not cause less premarital sex. That's why I'm looking for. Otherwise, it's just again descriptive. Yeah, that's what you have to do in these studies. You can't, even as you've admitted in your past debates, yeah, you can't necessarily find a causal Correlation does not, yeah, does not it's mean it's causation. You're applying causation. You're saying that child, yeah. you're countering my argument by saying that, well, child marriage does not uh, cause a lower rate of premarital sex. Yeah, and it's ev this is a study that shows evidence of that. She's case. saying that there's no correlation. She doesn't say anything about causation. She doesn't say anything about causation. She says correlation. Exactly. Yeah. But you're making a causal claim. I'm saying that's evidence to use your own phrase. 
It's, you know, like when you were debating it's Tom Jump. Of evidence. Remember when you were debating Tom Jump, you said you don't believe in the harm principle, but the harm is evidence of something that's bad. Right, right. In these studies, this is evidence that once again doesn't mediate the relationship. No, you're saying that there's, a co there's no cause, there's no cause between uh, pre, uh, between child marriage and a decrease in premarital sex. I'm right? saying there's no relationship. Correct? I'm saying there's no relationship. There's no relationship. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that this one study doesn't show a relationship, therefore there's no relationship. I'm saying there's no evidence of it. Okay, you, there's no ev evidence that you know of. Yeah, and you don't have any, you've not provided any. Right, so that my claim, <laughs> right, exactly. my claim, my claim to you was not regarding the evidence of that or not. My claim was provide a solution. Why, how can you reduce the rates of fornication that you're okay. supposedly so, Again, so much against? Increase religiosity, more education, Why don't you just ban it? Why don't you just ban it? You ban, you're, you're, in favor of banning, you're in favor of banning child marriage, so why can't you ban fornication for anyone not married? We do. You can't have, sleep with a minor. It's against the law? In, it's, it's called statutory rape. No, no, no. Between ten, two 10-year-olds. Ten why can't two 8-year-olds have sex? Are we going to throw 8-year-olds in prison because they, are, they can't even consent to each other? Is that your argument? No, no. Are you in favor of laws that ban two 8-year-olds fornicating? I would be totally in favor of preventing it. I don't know how you'd make it that a law, because again, they can't even get Why not? You have a law against child marriage, so, so wait, why so can't you have a law against fornication? Let's for, walk through this. For 10 so year olds. Let's walk through Nine this. year olds, why? Let's walk through this. Yeah, let's You want to say, okay, so let's, we're going to ban two 10 year olds from having sex. What happens if they have sex? They, they are punished for that. How? There are sanctions, they, they could serve prison time. I don't know. There's some punishment on the law that makes it illegal. So we're going to throw nine year olds yeah, in prison. Yeah, it's hard for you to imagine. It's hard for you to imagine. Because But sex. by the way, this is Mosaic law. By the way, this is what uh, Christianity has advocated. By the way, this is what canon law advocated. If two 10 year olds fornicate, they are punished according to Christian law, according to Mosaic law. This is so hard for you to imagine. It would be quite <laughs> simple for me to say they should go, they should be separated, first of all. They should have to go through some sort of like. A rehab type thing where Prison? they learn that they should not be doing this at Judy? 10. Judy? What? No, not Judy. That's why her. not? Why not? So why We're are you so hard? Them in there with so murders. someone so who's so someone who practices child marriage, like a 25 year old with a 17 year old, he should be locked up, right? Yeah. But two 10 year olds fornicating, that they should just have some nice rejuvenation or rehab. 10 year re olds cannot consent. They're consenting with each other. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So what are you going to do to punish them? Again, in the same way, in the same in the same way that you're going to punish the 25 year old. Okay, 25 year old can consent and knows what he's doing. That 17 year old doesn't know what sex is. At that point, a nation has to be defined by laws, Daniel. We just can't be like, oh, well, this. But you're not is in favor. You're, you're, you're in can favor. I finish my thought before you interrupt me for once, maybe? So once again, we have to be a nation of laws. We cannot just have every single child go to a judge and a medical expert, get a brain exam to know. We know puberty is complete in most people by 17, so the next age we grant is 18. This is a much simpler system. Sure, it comes with trade-offs, but when you're building a political system, there's gonna be trade-offs. And so we set the age of consent at 18, age of adulthood at 18, because that's when puberty is complete in almost all individuals. Got just two so, minutes left. So all I heard is a bunch of rambling, but no explanation for what kind of punishments or what kind of laws you would impose to curb fornication amongst children. That's you the haven't given is any not kind. What laws no, can it we is. do? The it's about child, be about sex child marriage. Yeah, exactly. You're in favor of laws that ban child marriage and have very severe consequences for child marriage. But I asked you about fornication, and you said that you, that is immoral. You're not going to say it's, if it's more or less immoral than child marriage. By the way. Uh, but I'm asking you what kind of laws would be parallel to, to prohibit fornication and curb that problem. Okay, I think adultery is wrong, but I don't think it should be illegal because... Then why is child marriage, why do you think child marriage should be illegal? Because you're harming a child, as I explained in my opening statement. Are two children fornicating harming each other? Yes, they are, but they don't know what they're doing because they can't consent. So how do you curb that? How do you, how do you create a stigma about that? How 30 do you seconds. make it illegal? How do we make it illegal? You don't. So you want to have a laissez-faire about laissez-faire attitude about uh, fornication. You keep to but you want the hammer of the law. What child you want the is. hammer of the law for child marriage, but fornication is something that oh well, you know, it's unfortunate. But these are kids; they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, kids do. Most that's of the, the time don't know what they're that's doing. inconsistent. Like no, that's kids don't know what they're doing. That's the way kids typically are, and that's why kids we help know to train what sex them is. Kids Rehabilitation know. is much better for this kids kind of thing than throwing them in prison like they're adults or like they're committed murder Gentlemen, or something. Gentlemen, we have to move into the five-minute closing statements. We'll start with Mike.
These are closing statements, folks. So if you have a question, get ready in 10 minutes. We'll start the Q&A. Mike, I've got it set for five minutes. The floor is all yours. Okay, so it appears that we have seen no evidence that child marriage is moral or should be permissible by any standard. Uh, everything we've just heard tonight is, well, I've seen people in the past do it. A lot of people in the past did it, therefore it should be okay. That was the, most of the evidence of what I've seen him give. I've seen no evidence to say that it should be allowed based on any data. Once again, child marriage leads to all sorts of harmful, of th harmful things. It leads to all sorts of psychiatric problems for these girls. Uh, they develop depression, isolation, anxiety, loss of identity. Uh, they develop all sorts of psychiatric issues that stay with them for life when they're forced in these situations. They also increase the likelihood of divorce because while your brain is developing, you're becoming someone new constantly until you're about 25 or so. This is why we see divorce rates stagger and basically drop to their lowest level between the ages of 25 and 30. Prior to that, they slowly, slowly increase back up. And when you're in your teens, you're very likely to get divorced if you marry that point. Um, if we actually want to favor uh, decreasing divorce, we should be outlawing child marriage because the data is quite clear on this. And it's across the cultures. Uh, we also see evidence that child marriages lead to all sorts of physical problems. Uh, Daniel tried to argue that, yeah, well, women over 40 have these issues as well. Again, if you go to a doctor over 40 and the doctor says, hey, you probably shouldn't have any more children, you could have some serious issues, then you probably shouldn't have a child. All right, that's quite that simple. I can be consistent and disagree with that. The difference is, is when you're under these ages, it is quite clear that uh, you also have all these psychiatric issues. Your pelvic bones have not reached the point where you're good at delivering children. And even early medical writers like Serranus of Ephesus noted this. Okay? Child marriage is extremely harmful mentally, emotionally, and physically for these girls. There's a reason why we're outlawing. It's not some vast conspiracy. Okay? It's because medical experts routinely, country after country, come out and say, this is harmful. We've conducted studies and interviews and psychiatric evaluations of these girls in India, Africa, Southeast Asia, throughout the Middle East. This always leads to harms one way or another. There are outlier studies, no doubt. So if there was some vast conspiracy, why are there outlier studies? Okay, Christianity is vehemently opposed to the practice of child marriage. He brought up the fact that Jesus never condemned it. Well, Jesus never condemned boiling cats. Okay, but we can still arrive at the conclusion that's probably wrong. Christianity is not like Islam. It lays down principles for us to be guided by. It doesn't have to give us an entire list of every do and don't. The okay? Bible is clear. The way you fulfill the law is by loving one another. Okay? We now know from the data that child marriage is harmful. So guess what? It's wrong. And a Muslim should know about the fallacy of presentism. Just because people in the past may not have known how harmful it was, okay? just like they didn't know that using leeches to try to cure diseases, was wrong does not mean we necessarily condemn them. We can still say it was wrong. They just had a lack of information. Christianity, according to experts like Robert Woodbury, Tom Holland, Rodney Stark, is responsible for a ton of scientific moral progress that has led us into the future. It's constantly saying, let's study the science, find out what's best for society. Okay, for some reason, when I'm debating Muslim apologists, they, kind of, they want to drag us back to the seventh century and leave us with the ethics there. Christianity wants to take us into the future. Islam wants to take us into the past. Now, I can agree there are a lot of harmful things about modern Western secular society, but we do not solve a problem with a worse problem. We're not going to replace the liberal dystopia we're in with Handmaid's Tale Islam style. That would just be a worse or equally bad dystopia. Child marriage is harmful. And trying to solve problems in society like kids sometimes fool around with each other by instituting something we know to be intently and innately harmful by according to every expert, then, we, then we, that's not the solution. That would just be another problem we have to deal with. It's quite clear we have seen no evidence that child marriage increases virtue, helps young girls to flourish. It leads to all types of harm, all types of issues that ruin these girls for life. Any educated society will outlaw child marriages if you care about your population. You're not going to install a Handmaid's Tale dystopia where children are forced in these marriages, suffer from psychiatric problems, which they then pass on to their children. Because it, the evidence, once again, as I cited, shows that they lead to complications when raising, raising their own children. There's a reason why every medical expert agrees with me up here and not with Daniel. The evidence is abundantly clear. And I barely scratched the surface. There are dozens of other studies I could have cited, but I don't have the time. There's just so much evidence that this is harmful. And we honestly should outlaw this around the world 
and start helping girls to flourish and live better lives, not forcing them into marriages where they're going to suffer immense harm. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go over to Daniel for his five minute closing as well. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Okay, so Mike is talking about, well, for 40 year olds, older women, uh, they should just ask their medical doctor to make sure it's safe. Well, why can't you say that for um, children as well? You can ask, you can, you can have minor marriage and before any consummation of the marriage, you ask the doctor, you have a full physical examination and then you make sure by the medical professionals that it's physically safe. Then would you be in favor of it? Uh, in favor of child marriage, then would it be morally, accept morally acceptable? Uh, Mike talks about psychological harm. Again, I cited studies showing that the psychological harm is due to a family environment, due to molestation, is due to other kinds of social stigma, and not due to the actual adult-minor relation. Emotional uh, damage as well. Again, the status quo now is one where child marriage is stigmatized, minor marriage is stigmatized. There's no stigma with children fornicating. Why is there psychological damage in marriage if you have like a 20 year old and a 17 year old getting married, which uh, Mike considers to be morally unacceptable. Why is that so emotionally damaging, but two 17 year olds fornicating is just fine, or two 10 year olds fornicating is just fine. What about, is it a surprise that there are no medical uh, studies showing the emotional damage that comes with uh, all kinds of uh, sexual promiscuity, that comes with all kinds of uh, behaviors that are socially sanctioned or socially acceptable in society. We don't find those kinds of studies in abundance. Why? Because it's determined by the culture. It's determined by the status quo. Um, he also says that every medical expert agrees with his position. Well, every medical expert now is saying that gender affirming care for kindergartners is something that's important. And if you prohibit uh, gender affirming care, then that is psychologically harmful for children. And it causes emotional damage for children. So again, all of these studies that Mike has cited, it just takes a very little bit of analysis to show that they're full of holes and they don't support the overall uh, contention of the debate on whether child marriage or minor marriage is morally acceptable. Uh, Mike also talks about Jesus never condemning boiling cats. Boiling cats wasn't an accepted widespread practice in the time of Jesus, but child marriage was, and child marriage was sanctioned by the Jewish rabbinic authorities at that time. Nowhere does he condemn that. Nowhere does he even come close to making an explicit statement condemning it. So overall, Mike uh, did not give us a solution for childhood sexuality and all of these uh, children fornicating. He hasn't proposed any outlet for these raging hormones starting from children at age eight or nine. Uh, did Mike explain how attitudes towards child marriage radically shifted in the last 300 years? No. Did Mike explain why Jesus didn't condemn the child marriage that was rampant in his time? No. Did Mike explain why the Bible never comes close to condemning child marriage and in many cases actually seems to command it? No. Mike has failed on all of these points. Overall, my opponent has refused to answer some of the very basic questions on this topic and his overall approach is full of inconsistencies. So finally, as a Muslim, I want to conclude by saying that I'm proud of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and everything he did. He was the most moral man, the greatest example for humankind, and his marriage to our mother Aisha is not a source of embarrassment or something for Muslims to be defensive about. Rather, it's something that is an inspiration to the world, a sick world, increasingly sick world that is destroying itself and doesn't even realize it. My opponent here has nothing to say about that overall trajectory. He called it progress in his concluding statement. It is so bizarre for a Christian to be promoting these kind of liberal, materialistic, atheistic values of progress while also condemning his entire tradition. A couple of months ago, the name of the Prophet وسلم, was trending on Twitter and it was because people were insulting him and attacking him, especially his marriage to Aisha, our mother Aisha. And when you looked at the kind of people who were the most vile and bitter in their venom against the Prophet, there was a clear pattern. These were people who were fervently against God. They hate God. They hate religion. They hate marriage. They hate family. They hate tradition. They hate gender norms. They hate everything that is decent and wholesome and good and just advocate this progress, which is really debauchery and degradation. So all of these haters consider the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to be enemy number one. What does that tell you about this man? 
Thank you very much. With that, let's give a round of applause before we start the Q&A. Thank you very much, gentlemen. in here keep it close to your mouth make sure you're asking a question asking a question not making a lengthy statement or anything like that and we will get you through this so first person come on down stand on the table so when uh, Muhammad you know, married Aisha right uh, the Abu Bakr actually uh, resisted uh, saying that you're my brother and then uh, when Muhammad said you know it's the will of Allah he agrees right and after that Omar and Abu Bakr actually uh, proposed marriage to Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, right? He says, too young. She, I mean, she's too young. So do you, don't you think that Muhammad was, was worried about his own daughter versus when it came to Aisha, you know, he just went, went ahead and did it? No, I don't think there's any such implication. You have different levels of maturity amongst girls who even might be the same age. So saying that, well, oh, my daughter is too young, but another uh, girl is not too young, that's not an inconsistency there. All righty. So in Genesis 24, verse 19, uh, it says about Rebecca, the three-year-old, uh, when she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. Uh, so she quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to draw water for the camels. She then says a little later, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, she replied, my grandparents are Nahor and Milka. Yes, we have plenty of strong feed for the camels and we have room for guests. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a really lucid three-year-old. So my question is, have you ever met a three-year-old? Yes, I uh, have a three-year-old, or I did two years ago, when I was five. So yeah, I uh, understand that ages can vary, maturity can vary across time, but the point is, what is, um, in, uh, established by the Talmud and by Jewish law. And so they, their interpretation of those verses are what they are. So you'd have to argue with them and argue with those rabbis. Obviously with modern interpretation, they want to try to explain that away. Um, but I don't find that very compelling, but others may disagree. So may I, okay. um, so yeah, sorry. So Rebecca being three years old is church tradition, t tradition, not something that is like fully backed by scripture. Well, what do you mean by backed uh, by scripture? Because when you have whatever interpretation and anyone 800 years or, or uh, 1800 years after purported revelation can come and say, actually, you know, I don't agree that this age was three or I don't, I think the minimum age of marriage is based on this passage, which seems to indicate breast development and like, okay, if that's your understanding of what is backed by scripture, uh, then yeah, I agree. You're going to be hard pressed to agree with, uh, you'll be hard pressed to find any pre-modern uh, position that is backed by scripture. So it says later on in Genesis that she covers her head. Most three-year-olds did not. In fact, I can't find any three-year-old that well, would cover their if head. If they were married, then that would be the law that they have to cover their head. So that's begging the question. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, my question, so I have similar questions to uh, Daniel and Mike. Mm -hmm. um, to Daniel, um, as one of the evils you mentioned that are brought about by the lack of child marriage was uh, masturbation. And I specifically want to ask about non-porn masturbation. So you seem to imply that non-porn masturbation is sort of clearly worse than child marriage. And it's an evil that must be eradicated by child marriage. I'd like to expand on that point, if I got it correctly. And for Mike, um, similar question. I'm assuming you're also against non-porn masturbation uh, in adolescence. Um, so my question is, the dominant literature on that would probably be that non-porn masturbation is not harmful at all. So why can you disagree with the scientific consensus on that subject completely and yet rely on it so much when it comes to uh, child marriage? Go, go ahead. I need a mic. Oh. Yeah, so uh, in Christianity, we believe there are different types of sins. There are sins that harm others. There are sins that harm 
yourself or your own spirituality, I would say that's more of a sin that harms your own spirituality as it directs you more to focusing on women as objects in a lot of ways. Uh, but no, it doesn't harm others. I mean, that doesn't mean necessarily is good either. I mean, I, using Daniel's own criteria that he used in his debate with Tom Jump, harm is evidence that something is bad. And so child marriage is severely harmful, much more than masturbation, as we can see from the data. And so that, that should why it should be abolished. But again, there are things that can be harmful, like lying. Uh, you know, I don't think that, you know, if I lie to like, you know, David or something, I don't think I should be thrown in prison for something like that. Uh, I don't think, you know, adulterers should be thrown in prison necessarily, even though I think it's wrong. So there's different types of sins, different things that are wrong. I would just say that child marriage is just, um, as Jesus talked about, a greater sin at times. So yeah, that's your answer. No, I, I think that the solution, as I mentioned, uh, I think what I said is completely consistent that um, marriage is better. Uh, and even for, you know, my own children, you know, according to what is the minimum age in our locality, I want them to get married as early as possible. I want them to get married, uh, I have boys, and I want them to get married in their teenage years if possible uh, because masturbation is something that has incredible amount of harm, psychological harm, emotional harm. These are things that Mike is blissfully unaware of because his understanding of what is harmful is just dictated by liberal morality that is enshrined within a very liberal scientific establishment. So that's why he's kind of uh, has this blind spot for things that his own religion condemns as extremely harmful, like masturbation, uh, but is just taking up the mantle for child marriage, even though the Bible uh, that he claims to advocate for condones it. So, I mean, this is an inconsistency in his, his position, not an inconsistency in my position. I think that uh, getting married as a teenager is much better than being masturbating, whether with pornography or without it. That's why, if I may ask, and I'll leave up that. Why it's that? harmful. It's uh, spiritually harmful. Uh, it's psychologically harmful. It's emotionally harmful. Uh, I mean, question. Sorry. Question for both. So, um, let's imagine that uh, that that we have a society with Sharia, and uh, would you guys say that it it would be uh, productive for a society to actually do that? Like, wouldn't there be uh, more possibility for? for a harmful situation, let's say like there's a lot of uh, stranded kids that, uh, y you know, are orphans, they're not in an orphanage, like they're just out there and people, and if we sexualize children, wouldn't that just make it much more uh, plausible that sexual abuse will, would happen, which we do see in, uh, in Islamic places? And wouldn't this, uh, and let your turn to keep it, for example, in the inside of marriage, but you believe in muta, for the audience, muta is a, is a short-term marriage where people uh, can marry for, let's say, like two days or a very short period of time, and then uh, instead of prostitution, they just do a very short marriage. So uh, would you like, for example, your kids to be uh, married in muta with a 52-year-old? Yeah, so... Um what was the first question? Can you come back? I'm confused on the question, I'm too. I'm confused on the question. The, what was the first question? <coughs> Sorry. So uh, the first question was on uh, what will be the, the implications in uh, society if we would accept uh, Sharia and Islam and fully yep. accept it in okay, society? What will be the, the uh, consequences on whether uh, more children will possibly yeah. be harmed if we sexualize them? Uh, it was that, and the second one, uh, if you live uh, in marriage, but you believe in muta, would you let your uh, children be given a marriage in muta for, uh, let's say, two days with a 52-year-old, and then just uh, consume their marriage, and then just everybody goes their way? No, would, you, would you allow that? So first of all, I'm not Shia. Muta is a Shia practice. Um, but, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say that you do have muta marriage as something acceptable. It's still not something that happens with like a two-year-old, as you said in your question. Uh, marriage is with parental consent when, it's, when you have a minor or someone who hasn't uh, gone through puberty. So that muta wouldn't even apply to a two-year-old. In, in my example, I said uh, some children are orphans, so... Uh, so, so they're guardian, it doesn't matter. Sorry, like they're guardian or parent or guardian. They're not in an orphanage, so they're, they're just trying to kids. kids. In, in some Islamic states, there's a lot of pedophilia in some Islamic states of kids that don't have parents. That no, so that would, just having so sex with a child... They marry if they don't have any illegal... You're just adding more questions. So the, the thing is that the 
kind of sex that's allowed is only within the bounds of marriage or concubinage. So that's something that does not, uh, you can't mix that with muta. Muta is a different practice and it's for Shia, not for Sunnis. Um, and the, the second question, so yeah, you'd have more child marriage and so there would be less uh, of these kinds of d degenerate practices that we find with children fornicating right, left, and center. Uh, and the second question, um, yeah, so I, I think I answered both questions. So Mike presented a whole bunch of evidence that child marriage was harmful, specifically physically. Uh, do you disagree with those at all? I explained in my, uh, in the rebuttal, I explained that there is a uh, likelihood or a chance of harm in any kind of sexual interaction. So for example, mortality. Yeah, there is slightly higher mortality for children uh, if they're having sex at say age 10. That's happening regardless without marriage. No one seems to have a problem with 10 year olds fornicating. It's only a problem if the, you know, if the person that they're fornicating with is one day over 18 as opposed to one day younger than 18. So you and Mike, you have no problem, or especially you as an atheist, have no problem with a 17-year-old fornicating with a 10-year-old. It's legal. You're not advocating for that to be illegal. The thing is that 17-year-old is below the age of... Okay, change the, a 13-year-old with a 10-year-old. Like, it's not illegal. They're, they're within the age of consent. So statutory rape is when you're over the age of... Uh, consent, having sex with someone under the age of consent. High schoolers, you can have a high schooler, a senior, fornicating with a freshman. It's not illegal. So people need to get you know familiar with the law. The thing is that, so the thing is that you have that kind of fornication that is completely allowed, that's completely permissible uh, within the law, and you atheists have no objection to it. If you want to talk about likelihood of medical harm, there's all kinds of medical harm associated with homosexuality. With sodomy, there's all kinds of harm associated with this gender-affirming care. There's all kinds of harm associated with women over a certain age having sex. You have no kind of con condemnation or moral argument that because of this likelihood of harm, those should all be banned, those should all be considered unacceptable. You have nothing to say about those kinds of sexual practices that have medical harm because you're not actually guided, your morality is not guided by an objective evaluation of health and harm, it's just um, determined by these social stigmas, by a liberal status quo that has been created in the past 300 years. All right, as a reminder to the audience, please keep your comments to yourself unless you're up here at the microphone. If you want to ask a question or debate it, come up and ask a short and pithy question that they can answer. Do not do it from the audience. Uh, when it comes to the marriage of a very young girl, uh, does the girl's consent matter at all, or is it only her father's? So there is um, the parent giving consent. So within certain schools of thought, if she comes of uh, puberty and then she decides that she is not, uh, she does not want to stay in the marriage, then some schools of thought within Islamic law give her the option uh, to leave that marriage. Is there, it's a complicated um, legal scenario, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I don't have like a position that I'm saying this is the Islamic position. I'm just saying that within Islam, there's a diversity amongst the classical scholars uh, on that on that specific issue. So can I, I just, I'm not going to comment on Islamic law. All right, folks, we're a little bit over right, time. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to get to that intermission, and then we'll come back with our final debate. We want to give one final applause. Thanks so much, Mike and Daniel. It's been a true pleasure. <laughs>